talking about one of the hottest topic, AI and medicine. Uh, we'll be talking about how reinforcement learning is being used. Uh, we'll look at what is this drug discovery process, uh, the drug target interactions, uh, the representation of drug target complex, and eventually we'll look at a model that, is, uh, that we have created to identify the drug pose. And we'll conclude with what are our next steps. All right. So a quick question before, how much time do you think it takes to get a drug to market? Any guesses? 18 months, that's, that's the COVID world, sure. 10 years, yes. So it takes really 10 to 12 years and approximately $2.5 billion to get a drug to market. And that, that is the scale what we are talking about. It, has, it includes a lot of complexity, tediousness, and a time-consuming process. So before we get into what this process is all about, few terms for people, um, from the, for the technical folks maybe. So what is a drug? A drug is a compound which has the ability to bind to a target and produce a biological effect. What is a target? A target is the identified uh, mostly recipient uh, protein or a gene that has the ability to uh, do certain functions and once it is impacted, the drug and the target form a complex which will eventually cause the required biological impact. Now the drug cannot just go anywhere and bind to the target, it has to bind to a specific place. That is called the binding site. Taking a real world example, in the lock and key uh, analogy, so here the target is the lock and the drug is the key. Putting into perspective, just there are 10 raised to power 60 drug molecules available and maybe crea being created more as we are talking. So the forming of the right drug target complex or the lock and key complex where only the right key will be able to open the lock. Getting back to the complexity, what this process is all about. So this process, uh, let's just take a step back and say when a disease is identified, uh, say when COVID came in, uh, did we know what COVID is? Fairly, some people knew it as a Middle East disease. But otherwise, how it started was people were getting sicker, medications were not working on them, certain biological tests, uh, x-rays and other tests were done to identify that, yes, there is a condition, there are, this is where it impacts, these are the receptor targets where it impacts. So that is how a target is identified uh, at a very high level. Once you have the target identified, the next step is to identify among those millions of molecules which is the drug molecule that will go bind to that target and produce the required biological impact. That again has its own you know, ways of doing it and when we say potential target, there is a reason to it because it goes, sorry, potential drug, because it goes through a lot of optimization and scrutiny so that it can become the actual drug for that particular target, which includes optimizing the drug so that it can be given in the right quantity, testing it for toxicity. You don't want to take a medicine for headache and eventually get it deposited in your liver, right? You want the medicine to act only on the headache. Then it goes under certain preclinical tests, followed by animal trials and then human trials. And finally, you get an FDA-approved drug. So looking at, you know, the, along with the number of steps, each of these processes have their own complexity. Some of the challenges that we uh, usually deal with is the unknown biological mechanism. So even when you identify the target, there are a lot of biological mechanism that you need to understand before you can really define that, yes, this is the drug that is going to work on this target. The selectivity of the drug target complex, it has to, be, it has to bind to the right place and in the right pose. If it just goes and binds somewhere else, will it produce the effect? No. Will it be harmful? Maybe. Toxicity, we just spoke about, that you don't want it to be toxic or impacting any other area of body. And along with that, there are a lot of challenges around something works in the animal model, but when it goes to the human model, it again fails and the cycle repeats. All of these processes are very, very compute intensive. Now, with that, the pharma industry and the research institutes have seen a lot of progress from the era of penicillin, where the drug was identified by accident and which has done amazing job in a lot of bacterial diseases to an era where there were a lot of methods of computational methods that can aid in the drug discovery process and then help in uh, accelerating them from a computational perspective. While these methods have their own benefits, 
certain challenges that these methods go through are scale, optimization, covering the chemical space, and specifically being so so compute intensive. Just to put things in perspective, if you look at the scale, we are talking about more than 30,000 targets only in a human genome, human proteome, millions of compounds that has the potential to bind or inhibit them. Imagine the number of combinations it can form and the, imagine the number of combination each of the drug and target complex can form. So that is the level of complexity we are talking about and the scale. And this is exactly where AI is stepping in very nicely. There has been multiple research papers and articles that will find how AI is accelerating the space. A few of the uh, recent advancements are one alpha fold, suppose some of you might be aware of it, created by DeepMind. Uh, yesterday only alpha fold released 200 million protein structures available for the research. Uh, so they essentially work on the 3D structure of the target, which will eventually help in easing out the drug discovery process. The other breakthroughs are in terms of the target and drug uh, affinity or binding them, right, we just discussed, and optimization of molecules. So rather than searching that entire space of molecules, can I optimize, generate optimized molecules so that my, my process fast tracks? So while AI is doing all of this amazing job, what are we going to talk about today, right? So our focus for today is specifically looking at this drug target complex and its binding at the right place in the right position. Then only it will be biologically relevant and cause the impact. Again, putting in the lock and key perspective, I have the target, I have the drug, I have the lock, I have the key. When the key is in the right pose, then only it will be op op open the lock. So now that we know that AI is doing a great job in optimization, we have an ask to you know, get the optimization done. The question is, can reinforcement learning help us in finding this optimized pose? So to answer that question, uh, we started with a hypothesis. So we already have experimentally proven drug and target, uh, you know, data sets. So can we use a reinforcement learning to look into those data sets uh, to understand first and foremost, why are they biologically relevant? Okay. And the reinforcement learning, the hypothesis was the reinforcement learning can understand why it would be biologically relevant because it can then look at the relevant atoms, which form those, uh, which kind of uh, get into those relationships and the, uh, you know, the interactions between those atoms which lead to that uh, docking pose or the pose with those drugs kind of get into. So to understand, let's start with reinforcement learning itself. So reinforcement learning is a mechanism of machine learning approach where, uh, you know, the agent learns by interacting with the environment. It is very similar to the way we human beings learn. So we uh, interact with the environment we understand how the environment changes to what all actions we do and from that we kind of un uh, learn what we can do to the environment to achieve a particular objective. Okay. So in this case, uh, the agent, the learner interacts with the environment, but the problem is the agent does not, cannot c kind of understand the environment directly. For us human beings, we have a senses which have evolved over the period of, you know, millennia. And we can kind of look and see and understand what the environment is. So first and foremost, what we have to do is we have to kind of interpret the environment and provide the agent with a state, which is a representation of that environment, which is a snapshot of the environment, which the agent is supposed to act on. Now, based on the state, the agent can take an action. Now to understand this, okay, let's assume I'm trying to learn to drive a car. So for me, the environment is the car and the surroundings around the car. And the actions which I have, let's take it's an auto drive car. So I have pressed the gas pedal to accelerate, press the brake to deaccelerate. So when I press the gas pedal, the car accelerates and that brings about a change in the environment. So car is moving, uh, there are things moving around. So that is a change in the environment. Similarly, the agent takes an action which leads to the change in the state of the environment. Now this change is not, uh, it does not change the dynamics of the environments or the rule governing the environment. It, it just changes the state. Now that the agent has taken the state, uh, taken the action, it generates a new state and on further interpretation, it generates a reward. Now coming back to the car driving example. So I'm driving, I see an obstacle in front of me. I have two options. I can either accelerate further or I can press the brake and stop the car. Let's assume I accelerate. I do not know what the consequences are yet. So I press the accelerate button, uh, accelerate pedal and the car goes and hits the obstacle. 
Now there is a change in the environment for the car. The car is damaged. Mostly, I mean, if I'm wearing a seatbelt, I do not incur any physical damage, but let's assume there is a cost associated with fixing that car now. That comes as a penalty for me. It's here, it's a reward, but it comes as a penalty for me and I associate the action of pressing the gas pedal in presence of an obstacle as a thing I should not do. Then I try again and press the brake and I see that there is, uh, you know, I do not hit the obstacle and that is a good state for me. Similarly, the agent kind of now creates a relationship between the input state and the action based on the reward. And by doing this, the agent eventually learns what are the set of actions which it can take given a state to achieve a required uh, objective. So let's understand what the environment of an agent is, okay? So this is the usual environments which we have seen in the RL world. So we have the Atari game set on which the open AI gym is built. Then we have the bipedal walker, the Luna lander, etc. And these all environments are governed by physical laws, so Newtonian laws. Similarly, in the drug discovery area or the drug uh, target interaction, we have the chemical space where uh, instead of physical uh, laws being applied, we have the chemical interactions getting applied. All right. So don't they look similar? You had a you had certain problems in the physical world. Now you have certain problems that has some kind of chemistry rules applied. You there you had a parking space where the car would go in park. Here you had you had a binding site where the drug would go in bucket. But is it is it really same? The drug target environment is way more complicated than the car parking in the gaming world. What what does it make so complex? Can you uh, with all those fancy examples, does any of them look that? like these weird structures, no, right? So let's have a look at these structures a little closely. The cyan, gray, and the blue ones are the target, and the, the smaller ones are the drugs. So only looking at the target, so their base structure, so, so the targets that I've taken here, functionally are very, very similar. But their base structure is where it, it has a similarity also. The complexity arises when they form the 3D structure, where they will be able to function. In that 3D structure, the spatial alignment changes. With that spatial alignment, will it have similar properties that the drug can come and bind? Maybe yes, maybe not. Most of cases, they, all of them form a unique complex. They have their own differences and they have their own commonalities in terms of chemical interactions. Similarly, if you see the grooves here or the binding site, the binding site might also differ in terms of the spatial allocation. If my spatial allocation is same for all, I would know that, see, this is the lock, this is how this lock works, I'll just put in the key and open. But that's not how it is. And then it again depends on the kind of drug I'm using. If you see here, the structure of all three of these drugs are different, but are, they belong to the same area, they belong to have the similar kind of function, but their structural and the environment is way, way different. Just putting these into the lock and key world again, I, if you see here, there are different cavities. Only when you'll have the right alignment with the drug, when you, will, when you have the right alignment with the cavity, you'll be able to fit in the key. Also, with the drug, the drug might just go and bind in the binding site. The drug might uh, be at the border of the binding site, lock it so that nothing else can enter. It might bind at a separate area so that the binding site is repositioned. So with all of these combination, it makes the environment really, really generalized. Right? So that is where we decided to deal with it iteratively. That rather than going with the entire drug target universe, let's look at a smaller piece first and see how reinforcement learning is doing a job there. So we picked up COVID and its close relatives as targets. We picked up different drug molecules that, can, that have an ability to bind there. So we have less uh, diversity in the target. The drug diversity stays there. Uh, we will definitely have different interactions. And now question for us is to identify the optimized drug pose for specifically SARS-1 targets, right? So now that we have created a specialized environment for our RL agent, the next step is to interpret that environment, make it understandable for the algorithm so that we can create some common representations. So for that, we first need to get the data. Right? We've been talking about the drug target complexes. Where do these complex data come from? So there are public repositories where the experimental data is available. So we picked up our relevant experimental data from the repository and then represented them. So these are the flat file formats uh, from where you can, you can get it. And they have all the information like how, the, how it is distributed, 
uh, what kind of interactions it has, how is the spatial coordinates, and raises other information. While we are talking about the interactions, how, how do they really interact, right? How do we have been saying that the drug goes and binds to the target? How do that really happen? So I would like you to just put on your chemistry hats, go back to your grade 12 chemistry for a while. The underlying structure for all of these are chemical entities. They are a bunch of atoms and bonds at a very, very basic level. So if you see here, the green and gray ones are part of target. The blue one is the part of drug. So when a drug is identified, a potential drug is identified, it will be binding to the target with certain level of affinity and with certain level of interactions. It will form hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions that are relevant to, that are relevant for that particular drug target complex to have an action. Now if I just put in a mirror image of this drug, it may just go and bind at the same places, but will it have the same interaction? No, because the atoms, they would have their own properties, the drug molecule atoms would have their own properties, the target molecule atoms would have their own properties and also as, a, as when they interact, the strength of those bonds will be different when the structure is different. So we, yeah. so we need to look at from that perspective that the interactions really fit in to the desired drug target complex. Putting this back into the perspective of the lock-in key, the key would only open the lock when there is shape complementarity and there are required touch points or interactions. So that brings us to an interesting question. So what should be the data structure of choice, which kind of does justice to this complex, uh, you know, representation? This data structure should be uh, able to capture the idea of atoms and its features, and also uh, capture the idea of interactions between these atoms, uh, both within a molecule and between two molecules. So let's uh, start by defining a uh, atom, okay? So let's take an example, uh, a basic uh, simple molecule. What we have done is we converted that molecule into a point cloud. Now what we need to understand is, this is, uh, I mean here the representation is 2D in nature, but when it comes to the point cloud, it is three dimensional. The molecule is three dimensional in structure. And we uh, take one uh, atom inside it and those are the properties which we have captured. The coordinate kind of uh, justifies the reason why it is a 3D structure. Now, th for the interaction, uh, as we had mentioned, we have two types of interaction which we are trying to kind of capture. One is within the molecule and the second one is between two molecules. The first example is within that molecule. So, we join these two uh, points uh, with a edge and capture the relevant features for those edges. And between two molecules, a similar approach is followed where the, uh, you know, the interacting atoms, uh, edges introduced between them. And the, uh, the type of features that capture kind of differentiate between them. So that brings us to the next point. Okay, I have, uh, I mean, I have a way to kind of define the structure. Now I want to put it in a perspective of machine learning approach because underlying RL kind of uses a machine learning representation altogether. And for that, what we have used is a graph CNN representation. And certain reasons why we went with that is, first and foremost, the edges, you know, the edges implicitly capture the idea of chemical interaction. We do not have to add special data structures to specifically capture the idea that there is an interaction between two nodes. Second is the spatial proximity. Uh, if you take an example of 3D CNN, the spatial proximity is within the structure itself. But in graph, we can reintroduce the idea of spatial proximity by adding additional edges. So these are not part of the chemical structure or the data which we have, but we add them based on the spatial proximity of these two atoms. Now, the geometrical structure is something which we need to recapture. Uh, 3D CNN does that job because it already is a 3D structure. But when we look into a graph, it's a flat structure. Uh, so we have taken a three-dimensional structure and converted it into a flat file. What we have to do now is capture certain features which uh, represent these three-dimensional information. So you can have relative coordinate system, uh, uh, angles, etc., which kind of show that these are three-dimensional, how they are three-dimensionally aligned with each other. And finally, a graph structure uh, or a graph CNN is uh, kind of performant as compared to the 3D CNN because here it is just dealing with the sparse data. With the 3D CNN, you'll have to actually insert those filling areas, I mean, the missing data. And hence, this is uh, really performant at this point. So to summarize uh, the representation part, so we have represented the chemical structure as a graph, nodes represent the atom, and the interaction between these atoms are captured as edges. 
Now that we have a representation, now the next part is for the drug to be put in different poses so that the RL agent can take, uh, you know, uh, the RL agent can understand why they are of uh, relevance. So for that the RL agent has to take an action to generate these poses and we need to understand how these actions can be defined. For that let's take an example, uh, three different molecules. Here the green, the orange and the red represent different poses the drug can be in. And if you, if you kind of uh, try to look at it logically, I can move from the green pose to the orange pose by doing a translation in space. So X, Y, Z coordinate translation can lead me to the orange position. And from there, if I do a slight rotation and again a translation, I can reach the red position. So if I, if I put both of these things together, the kind of actions which I need to define to generate new poses is uh, just translations in the X, Y, Z coordinates or rotations along the X, Y, Z coordinates. Now with this, uh, we can kind of define a loop where the RL agent can start learning. So what we have as input is the experimental data uh, where the drug target pose is known. We randomly rotate it uh, and translate it in space so that the agent can now recreate this pose, learn how to recreate this pose. This is converted into the uh, graph structure. The agent interprets it and uh, performs certain actions which kind of uh, suggest which the next pose can be. Now this pose becomes the new input for the next state or iteration and this continues until either we run into the iteration boundary and we start a new episode or when the agent has actually recreated the pose, we stop the iteration and say, yes, the agent has learned how this pose can be regenerated. But for that, we need to kind of tell the agent what a good pose is. Okay, so we uh, have to kind of come up with a reward system which can differentiate between three poses. So in this example again, this is a bad pose. That is a better pose than this and that is the best pose. The red one is actually a superimposition. So it's, a, it's the best pose which the agent can reach. So how do I tell the agent that green is bad, orange is better and red is the best. So if an agent takes an action which moves from green to orange, I need to reward the agent saying that yes, this was a good action. Go ahead, learn it. But instead if it moves from the orange to the green, I need to penalize the agent and say that don't do it. And for that, uh, what we have used is the root mean square deviation or error of the actual coordinates of the atoms. So we have taken the target pose, uh, the exact uh, drug pose experimentally available and we have uh, done a deviation between the atomic coordinates with the pose which the agent has generated. And using this, uh, this gives you a number between zero if it is an exact superimposition, or two it can range up till infinity depending on where the uh, next pose is. This is what the agent is supposed to minimize. So agent has to reach a state where the RMSE is zero. But reinforcement learning is about collecting rewards, increasing the reward. So we have to convert this problem into a maximization problem. And for that what we have done is we have chosen a function, inverse sine hyperbolic function which has a very specific shape because of a reason. Now, if you look uh, at the, uh, you know, the, uh, from when the RMSE decreases from 1 to 0.5, the increase in reward is really sharp. This kind of gives the last mile push to the agent that, you know what, you have reached there, but if you reduce it further, you'll get a higher reward. So we come to the overall uh, architecture of how the uh, our reinforcement learning looks like. So for input we have the drug target complex which is experimentally available. We convert it into a graph structure which then is uh, fed into the RL learning uh, algorithm which is a deep QN network. And uh, here the input is the state and what this uh, uh, neural net does is it builds a relationship between the state and the action. It's a goodness uh, relationship. And the agent keeps a copy of whatever it has done in the past so that it can revisit it and learn. Yeah. So you can see our agent has done a lot of hard work and I always relate RL to parenting. So when kids do a good job, they get rewards. Uh, when they don't do, there are consequences. And that is where, let's see what our agent has been able to achieve so far. So this is the optimized pose that we have achieved. So here the yellow one on the right side image, the yellow one is the actual experimental pose. The green one is where the agent started from and red is where it has reached so far. So it gives us a good enough result for the specialized data set that we have. And we also validated it against the um, experimental data and saw the interactions were very similar. So there are high chances that this pose is also biologically relevant. Now that we had it for our specialized data, we want to, uh, we want to expand it to get to the diversity that we had, you know, identified earlier. 
So what we want to look at to create models that will go beyond a specialized data and cover the larger space of drug target universe. For that we need to build generalized representation so that we can cover that bigger space. Also there is a lot of work during post production that is done by the biologist that is the structural biologist would sit and identify you know this is what is good, this is what is not good. Can we identify that information? and help the RL agent along with the public repositories to make informed decisions so that it can learn what our uh, experts are doing and be able to do it to some extent. So these are our current publications that we have had so far. So we had done this work as part of drug discovery hackathon uh, we, that was launched by government of India. We won phase one and now we are part of phase two. This is our technology stack. This is our amazing team who has been pulling this off. That is all from our side. Thank you very much.